You go to church and hear a sermon and it's got all sorts of, you know, solid sounds to it. Do you ever despair of doing any better? Do you? Do you know what sermons like that? I think when I was a young man I probably preached quite a lot of sermons like that. that were, you know, oh, try harder sermons. Um, because perhaps young energies were being poured into that and young theology hadn't been well worked out uh, perhaps at that stage. Or perhaps as well worked out as it has been better. Do you ever despair of doing better? Being a better man or, or, or a better woman? You quietly nurture a sense of your own spiritual inadequacy. Feel that you're something of a spiritual lightweight. Do you know, one in five people in America surveyed recently, big, big sample. One in five read the Bible every day. Are you one of the four in five? And you feel it. You sense that perhaps you're a bit of a spiritual lightweight. You really need to do some spiritual bodybuilding to have to come up to the standard of the people around you. But fear you lack the commitment and the discipline to, to do the necessary training. See, I, I, I secretly suspect a lot of us can very quietly, without anybody knowing, can end up living in that place. And it's all because we haven't understood Colossians. Or Romans or Galatians. <laughs> Genesis, for that matter. And what it says about... These things. So once more, for the sake of all who haven't really been listening, Paul spells out the way for the Christian to bring about the change needed to live out the God-pleasing life in Colossae. A place that's feeling its best days are gone. And its economy is in recession and its young people have left. He's had to live a God-pleasing life, live a God-pleasing life in a place like that. Under circumstances like that, where you're feeling on the back foot like the inadequate people, because everybody's gone to Laodicea now. And the churches are big there. On the basis of all the work you've done over the years. How do you said about living a God pleasing life in these reduced circumstances? It's got nothing to do with the ritual, rules, or religion we looked at last time in this passage. So here it is. Here's the key. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seek at the right hand of God. And set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things. For you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life appears. Then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death therefore. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. See, we, we tend to do it like this. We say, oh, I've got this bit of earthly nature about me. I've got to stamp on it. I've got to deal with it. I've got to, oh, such hard work not doing or doing or whatever it happens to be. You've missed the first four verses, says Paul. You're going to bat it the wrong way. And you're going to lose in that particular battle. Paul has been uh, dealing with all this fancy, highfalutin uh, nonsense doctrine of the heretics at Colossae. And he takes them back, these Colossians now, who are threatened by all of that, he takes them back to thinking on Christ's cross and resurrection and its implications. There used to be an old pigman from the West Country that we used to meet when we were showing pigs many, many years ago with small boys and a oh, small girl. And... Uh, <laughs> He'd every now and again, he'd give somebody something to think about, and then he'd say, Think on. Think on. And Paul was saying saying, Jesus, think on. Think on it. When you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Key point in your battle with sin. There's all these rules and regulations about chapter 2, verse 23. But they're of no value in restraining sensual indulgence. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Here's the way to deal with it. Here's how you deal with it. That chapter division is most unfortunate at chapter 3, verse 1. Yeah? That is most unfortunate because the whole thing runs through. See how it goes? Think about Jesus. Here's how you deal. 
Here's how you restrain. Indulge in your senses. What feels good, baby? Do you remember that? It feels good, do it, baby. You're too young. You wouldn't remember any of that stuff. But you're living with the implications of it now. Okay. So, since you've been raised with Christ, seek what's above herself. See that woman's eyes are turned upwards? She's looking up. Seek what's above. Zeteo is a Greek word much like the English word seek with a wide, wide range of meanings. It's particular references to a person's will, perhaps, which can be directed, you can direct your will to profitable things or to unprofitable things. Direction of the will, seeking, what you're after. What are you after? Paul uses the present imperative, indicating that sustained effort is going to be required to go on seeking what's above. Because there's going to be plenty that pull you, pulls you towards seeking what's below. Earthly. But at this point, effort is required. The effort is required not to struggle with that sin. The effort is required to direct your mind to what's above, to seeking heavenly things. Now, I know the NIV says, set your mind on things above, but what it really says here is seek. Actively pursue to get hold of the things that are above. Invest in Heaven's Bank because it's not going to go bust. Seek the things that are above. These other things are going to go up in smoke. Seek what's above. Now firstly, of course, Paul is speaking metaphorically of the heavens being up there, right? I'm not saying to you, heaven is up there. Was that first Russian spaceman in space? Can't remember the guy's name. Yuri Gagarin, was it? He said, I went to space and I didn't see God. Therefore, you know, there is no God by implication. Blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Rubbish. Okay, Paul is using a spatial metaphor to describe heavenly realities. And he's saying up there. To describe the two ages, you know, the present evil age and the age that is to come. Set your mind on that world that's coming. Where the answer lives, as opposed to where the problems live. The idea is that every good and godly thing is up there, whilst the realm of unspiritual sinful things was on earth, hence worldly. So set your mind on things above. Ta anos tente. Um, the things above heavenly things. Set your heart, desire, seek heavenly things. Let me ask you a difficult question. Have you been seeking heavenly things at all this week? Well, after all, why would you? Well, for the reason Paul gives next, of course. Set up question. Why? Why seek the things above? Since you've been raised together with Christ, and it's where Jesus is seated. Since You've been raised with him. You've been raised together with Christ. No question about it, no shadow of doubt. It's a because. And this is really the counterpart to chapter 2, verse 20. Since you've died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why do you still submit to its rules? That's in chapter 2, 20. There it is, since you died with him. Here it is, since you were raised from death together with him. Dying in his death, raised with him in his resurrection, and he's seated at the right hand of God. So, Okay, how did you die with him? We saw back then. Repentance, faith, baptism, you died together with Christ. And because of what he did, atonement, justification, reconciliation, you've been raised together with Christ. Been united to him in his death and his resurrection. Symbolizing baptism, and, and now you're living this new life. Seeking the things that are above. Since you were raised together with Christ, out of the sheer change of direction he's brought to you, through dying to that old way of life, being raised together with him, because of that sheer, sheer, sheer change of direction he's brought to you, well, out of that he's brought to you gratitude for the life he's given you, and a desire for the things that he's got for you. Seek above. Seek Set your mind on those things. We'll come to that shortly in verse 2. Why? Well, the fundamental reason is that that's where Jesus is. He's your life. If you're a Christian, he's your life. So you seek what's there with him. You seek him. If you're a Christian, you've been overcome with the greatness about Jesus. I mean, the greatness of Jesus. He's great. Would you recommend Jesus to you at all? I mean, you know, most, most, most church people wouldn't, really. Looking at him, they wouldn't recommend him at all. 
we've got this thing on Facebook, haven't we? You know, there's a page, and you can recommend this page. By the way, that is a plug. Please, will you go and recommend the page? Because nobody has. If you go and have a look at the page and recommend it, right, that'd be nice. Um, but would you recommend Jesus? Think about it. Is the quality of your life following Jesus such that you would recommend it for somebody else to follow as an answer, as the way? If not, this needs attending to. Seek Jesus. Set your mind on seeking Jesus because that's where the one who is your life is. He's there in heaven, in heavenly glory. And, and it's where he is seated. Job done, sat down on the throne of God, ruling the universe, while we're surrounded by scenes of far lesser glory in this veil of tears which presents itself every day to our senses. Seek that. Wouldn't you very much want to fix your gaze on what's there? Wouldn't you want to seek that? Now, I don't know about you, but I need incentivising. Do you need incentivising? Um, I get up of a Monday, particularly of a Monday, right? And I've got this list of jobs, is that true? <laughs> and, you know, it can it become quite overwhelming, can't it? I've got to do this lot today. Certainly after the weekend, it seems like there's a list of things that have got to be done. And it really helps a lot to just say, when I've done all that, I'm going to do this. Do you know what I mean? This is where I'm going. This is what I'm heading for. This is going to be great. And Paul is saying, hang on. You're living here in this veil of tears where sometimes being a Christian is quite costly. I mean, for us, we feel it's costly. Imagine what it would be like if we were in some closed country somewhere with our small kids or whatever. You know, we can't begin to imagine, can we? It feels costly. But look what's there. Look where it's getting me. Look what's at the end of this. Fix. Fix your minds there. Set your mind on these things. Seek that which is above. And when I'm in a situation where I've just got to knuckle down and get on with something I don't want to do, I really respond to be able to look forward. Paul has said, look forward. Look forward to something else that lies ahead of you that you can look forward to when the nasty stuff is over and done with. Since you've been raised together with Christ by virtue of what he's done, seek the things that are above where he is seated, reassurance there of his job done, at the right hand of God. That's what you go for. That's what you seek. That's what you're after. That's what you're looking for. Well, actually, that's not all there is in this verse. There's a strong emphasis on det determined continuation in this seeking. But then Paul takes it a little further in verse 2. Seek, yeah. But also, set your mind on what's above. First, it's about what you're looking for. Seek what's above. Second, it's about what you're looking at. Set your mind on the things above. Remember what Jesus asked his disciples about who people said he was? I'm thinking of Mark chapter 8. Do you remember that? Some people say John the Baptist. Some people say Elijah. Some people say one of the prophets. Who do you say I am, says Jesus? You're the Messiah. Well done, Simon Bar, Jonah. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he started talking to them about all the things that the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected by man and cast out. Peter took him on one side and said, Lord, surely not, and rebuked him. And Jesus said, Can't you behind me say why? Because your mind is on the things of earth, not on the things of God. What made Jesus turn to Peter and call him Satan? His mind was on the things of earth, not on the things of heaven. And that puts you on the old Knicks team. The difference between a faithful follower of Jesus and Satan seems to be, according to Jesus in Mark 8, whether you have your mind set on the concerns above or on earthly things. That's how important the issue that Paul is addressing here is. Set your minds on things above. Sounds pretty like verse 1, of course. It's quite a different word that gets used here. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, set your mind on things above. I've got to tell you, it's, it's a misleading translation there in the English, because hearts and minds are pretty specific ideas in English, as if you're setting your emotions and then setting your intellect. No, it's not that in the original at all. That is completely misleading. Um, don't go with that. It's just set your mind on things above. For later, consider. Consider. Brian says it's rather a neutral term. It's about thinking, considering, judging, generally giving one's mind to in the most broad of senses. Not so much what you're looking for as what you're looking at. What do you think about? 
Ooh, don't answer that question, I don't want to know. What do you think about as you go about your daily life? What's going on in there? Because this is true, isn't it? As you're pottering around your laboratory or your li library, gym, um, as you're pottering about the place, doing your work, your mind's doing stuff, isn't it? As you're still waiting for the bus, as you're driving the car down the road, your mind's doing things, what's it doing? What's interesting, there's a hole in the hedge. Paul is saying, take those minds of yours that are always running, and set them running on something else. Set them running on the things of God, but Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Not simply an act of the intellect, of course, this from it, oh, this word, a movement of the will. It's got to do with aims and motives underlying them, because your mind, your personality, your character runs on the thoughts that are normally taking place inside that cranium. The thoughts that are going on there form the character and the personality out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth, speaks. There's Jesus. Now remember, the direction of travel of Paul's thought is away from a heresy-filled, this worldly pattern of thought and sinful, chaotic life that gets spawned out of those things, towards a heavenly things above where Jesus is, new world of thought. And the ordered, disciplined, sanctified life that this pattern of thinking creates. There is no doubt that the thoughts that go round in your head will issue, will emanate forth. Emanate forth. I'm tired. The words are getting quite big. It's going to spew out into your life and the way you live and the personality and the character that you manifest in the world where God has put you. It's an admonition to be heavenly minded, not earthly minded, along with all the things that brings along with it. Now Paul is not saying, Oh Lord, heavenly minded, mighty thoughts, well, don't go there. You know that ain't right, don't you? But he is saying, let your mind run on the things of God. And it will determine and help in your living for him. Set your minds on things above. And everybody's going, yes. And every secular commentator in the media and in the press and what they Yes, that's nice. We want, we want our religious people to be basically good and godly, because that's rather a good thing. And you've stated a positive. Set your mind on earth. Yes, we need earthly-minded clerics. Yes, absolutely. And Christians as well, as long as they don't bring it to work. So, set your minds on earthly things and pause it. Whoa, 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 not on earthly things. On heavenly things, not on earthly things. The negative comes into play straight away. Set your mind on things that are above. That's great. No one objects because they don't have the full picture yet. If you're going to do this, then you are not going to do that. Hang on. There's a restriction in place. Obviously, really, that a world so committed to the compromised task of having its cake and eating it, the picture hasn't been grasped and the positive requirement is asserted, but seven shades of protest break out when you assert the negative. Did you see QI last night? On the telly, did you see QI XL last night? We did, didn't we? And immediately there's Bill Bailey talking about cognitive dissonance. Right? This is a modern phrase, we have an older word for, it's called hypocrisy. It's when your mind is holding different things in tension together, as if you're living with self-contradiction. I know there's a, there's a technical end of cognitive dissonance, but when Bill Bailey was talking about it, that's what he was talking about, okay? So I know, you know, like, I'll write about it, I know what you're saying, but this is what Bill Bailey was on about. Set your minds on things about not on earthly things, when you say both things. Now, of course, it's an enormously big ask. We've got how many senses, Callum? Uh, six. Five. Five? Five, I'm used to. Anybody uh, else? Have you found some six? Sixth sense would be common sense, wouldn't it? Do you include the glasses? Do you include the glasses? No, no. We've got five senses, mainly speaking. And each of those five senses bombards us with sensory input throughout every day, every waking hour. And each of those channels, each of those sensory input channels, persuades us to set our minds on earthly, temporal things. You see material things. You smell material things. You taste. Hmm? We do not have a third eye in the middle of our forehead to see heaven with. Right? We don't have a second pair of ears flapping around here somewhere at the top of the head to hear the angel's song. Right? 
almost our entire information and communication book comes to us from or about things on earth. And we can't switch it off. It's like we've got to have it, but we mustn't let it master us. And there's a problem. There's a problem there. You've got to walk over the muddy field. And some clag is going to stick to your boots. Your mind is going to have to be concerned with this world. But be careful, says Paul, you don't set your mind on it. Controlling your thinking, controlling your mindset, that's going to be quite a battle, but that is the battle. Not wrestling with a particular individual sin as the first port of call. You will, but the first port of call is this, is to fill your mind with the things of God, the things about and not with earthly things. Now here are two motivating reasons he comes up with to take hold of the things your mind runs on, your average everyday thinking about things, and set your minds running on heavenly realities, says Paul. Get hold of your thoughts then. Get them off worldly things and onto heavenly things. And here is the first reason, a reason from your past, verse 3. Colossians 3, 3. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I picked that photo of baptism because that girl looks so horribly shocked that she's just been baptised that it gives the impression, oh, what have I just done? Oh, oh, am I alive? Yeah, well, you are, but in a sense you've just died. Right? Because you've gone underwater, as it were, dear, and it's been quite a shock to you. But it symbolises this whole death and rebirth that takes place when somebody turns from sin, the old way of life dies, and you come to life again in Christ as a new life to be. You die. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What? What on earth is he thinking of here? You die? Picks up on 2.20, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, <coughs> why as though you still belong to the world, you submit to its rules? It's a metaphorical death. It's that death that we died when we, we stopped living that life and we started living this life. When we came to Christ, it describes... Finishing our heart's affair with this worldly stuff and breaking it off with the temporal to live for, to inherit the eternal. And the idea is that when a person dies, they, they are no longer to do with this world. Their relationship to this world has ceased. They, they don't have an economic relationship to it. They don't have a social relationship to it. It's gone. There's been a radical separation. A thoroughgoing breaking it off. Nothing to do with it anymore. You don't look to get anything from this world's things, nor do you invest in this place, says Paul. Your citizenship doesn't get to be in heaven when you expire, when you die. Your citizenship is in heaven now because you died to this world and you trusted in Christ and you're living for glory, not for the stuff that's passing away. Set your mind on the stuff that's above, says the Apostle. Seek it, get your mind on it, because you've already died to this stuff and your citizenship is already in heaven. Here it is. Your life is a hidden life. You can't see it, smell it, touch it, taste it, kick it, you know? It's a hidden life. Your life is in heaven with God. And your five senses speak to you moment by moment throughout every day of things that are visible and tangible. And your sensory inputs are taken moment by moment from things that are material and visible. But the life you live, says Paul, the life lived in union with Jesus Christ, is a life that is hid, live, lived out hidden from sight. Hidden from those senses. It's hidden from sight because the Christian's life is a life that is stored away in heaven with God and in fellowship with Him in the Spirit day by day. Feed Him. Your life is not here in the temporary. It's up there in eternity, hidden with Jesus in God. Hidden here, but certainly not hidden up there. So don't go by the temporary visible stuff then. This stuff that's passing away, that the world that is also passing away shoves up in your face. Your life is hidden with Christ. You died at some point in the past to this worldly life in sin, in a, in a place that's passing into the night. So seek out the things that are found above and set your mind and run your aspirations on what's there, where you're going, if you want to, to get yourself God-pleasingly to that place. Here's the reason from your past. Here comes the reason from your future. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's where we're going. It will be apparent then, it will appear then. Fill your mind with this. What's that? 
going to achieve. That's what's going to achieve putting to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Living for heaven. Living with your mind run on that, not with the stuff that your eyes and your hands, your nose, your ears, been flooding into your head. We will look more closely at this stuff next time, but for the moment please be clear, where this seeking the things above and this setting your mind on what's above, because of your past experience of Christ, because of your future hope of glory, let's set our minds on where this is going to take us. Be clear about this. See, Paul in these verses is, is deceit-proofing the people of God, and he's beginning to turn to sort of dealing with the moral implications of all of that. If you believe lies, then uh, you end up living a life that's based on lies, and it's a life that isn't going to be terribly moral. It's going to be a life that says, this satisfies you, that satisfies you, this is what you want, this is the thing to go for, this will be great. It's not. So Paul in these verses has brought out his can of systemic weed killer, as it were, and he's going to wither off and eradicate from the roots those things that make you think you really should be doing better, and misdirecting you and the Colossians into that blindest of alleys, that blind alley of thinking that greater effort at rules and ritual and religion is the key to, to making you up as that far better person you want to be. You should be. No. It's a little value in restraining sensual indulgence, says Paul. What is? Seeking and setting your mind. Not mind games, not myth building, not self help and lying strategies. But filling your mind with the invisible realities of heaven, of Christ and of your salvation. Pursuing filling your mind with that, hard, by faith, from day to day. It's a displacement. Set your mind on things above that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. See, it seems like a paradox this. It seems like a paradox, but it is not. That trying to be good the way human beings naturally try to be good, it simply doesn't cut it. Now, there are things to turn away from, but there are things to turn to. And if you're trying to turn away from and you're not turning to, and you're not filling up your mind with this stuff, says Paul, forget it. You're going to fail. You're going to end up with the ritual, the religion, the rule scenario that Paul's been showing us in the preceding verses is the denial of the efficacy of Christ's cross. Saying it isn't sufficient. And also showing your life isn't changed by it. Who's not troubled by sin? If you're a Christian, you're troubled by your sin. Because that sin put Jesus on the cross and it shows you up for being the failure that you are. But the way we fight back is by taking control of our thinking, says Paul. The things we seek and the things that we direct our gaze at. In short, what we do is we tackle indwelling sin in believers like this, by focusing our minds on things above, not on earthly things. If you're not thinking about it, you only do it. Young person once challenged, Christian person, challenged by a fairly religious group of people that they were accountable to about the conduct of their new relationship. Turned to the older Christian who was being quite legalistic about a lot of different things. He said, Listen, we don't look at anything, we don't touch anything, we certainly don't make out. Well, of course you don't, because you're not looking at anything, you're not touching anything. You're not filling your mind with things that are going to get you in trouble. Does that make sense? Paul says, don't fill your mind with things that are going to get you in trouble. Fill your mind with the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. There's no room for the other trash then, is there? Make sense? Makes sense. It's doing it. It's the thing, isn't it? And we do this rather than engaging in some sort of ritual, religion, rules-motivated, arm-wrestling contest with the enemy of souls. Think you're going to win that one? Forget it. Shut him out. You don't let him in the bar to have the arm wrestle in the first place. Easy. And we do it by filling our minds in. So that he is excluded by the presence of the God who alone has the strength to overcome him. Lord Jesus. We've died to earthly things. We've been raised with Christ. And the call of this passage is to so fill our thinking with this all-conquering, soul-satisfying Jesus, there is no room for the things that drag us down. 
And I'd say not only this is the way to deal with sin that is biblical and effective, but that if you want a challenge, that's probably quite enough of a challenge in itself, isn't it? And that, it seems to me, is the lesson of Colossians 3.